Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Express Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at Work, More Than Just Lip Service, with our guest speaker, Claire Kemsley, and which has been organised by the CIM Greater London Group. So, I would now like to hand over to Claire Kemsley, Managing Director, UK and Ireland of Hayes Marketing, who is our guest speaker today. Over to you, Claire. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, and, and before I share the ed &I data and insights, um, I'd like to give you a snapshot of the market uh, drawn from the uh, many different uh, data sets that we acquire through the many different surveys we do. Some of these surveys we do annually, such as the salary, um, salary guide, which I'm going to touch on today just to give you some market insight. Some of them are just reproduced um, as the market calls. For them, for example, the end of the nine to five, um, everything you need to know that employers want from a skills perspective that changes obviously uh, on a regular basis, and empowerment um, and top job information. Um, these these are um, produced probably on a, on a biannual basis. And as I say, sometimes if there's a particular sentiment in the marketplace, if something is changing, obviously we've had a very challenging two years, then we do go to our very wide customer base and try and get some data and then share some insights with you on how the world of marketing feels. Most of the uh, data that we collect is from about 14, 15 different professions. Um, and then what we do for this audience and for our customers is break down that data and show some of the um, organic data and then extract out what marketers and comms people may feel on particular challenges, particular issues. I, I use the data um, with round tables. So if, if anyone's interested in attending one of those, we have a four or five uh, key decision makers at a round table um, and we dig a bit deeper, I guess, into some of the data that we have here. Um, and it leads to some quite challenging conversations for marketing and comms people to, to face, whether it's about the shift in shape of their own business or their own career. So if we could just take a little look at the 2020-22 salary survey guide. If we just pause on this for a moment, this is the eighth year that we did this survey. And the reason I want to share this with you is because we've got some up-to-date market information that I think you'd be interested in before we delve into the ed &I report itself. We uh, surveyed over 23,500 people um, last September, October 2021 to get this information for you. And of that, a sizable number were from the marketing profession itself. I'm only gonna share a couple of slides to give us a quick overview today, um, but you are welcome to have access to the full report. And at the end of this, um, please ask me any questions in the Q&A. Um, and if, um, you're, if, if Phil is happy, we can share other reports with you um, via a link. Um, so, so let's start with some of the market data. So what did we discover about how the market feels? Well, this is your marketplace in the last six months, a huge amount of vacancies. And it's really super interesting to see that in the top five or six, we've had product online marketing manager, marketing assistant jumping between those first four or five positions since January of last year. This is quite up to date. This is just the last six months. And this gives us an idea of how busy your marketplace is, how busy your world is, because this isn't all about recruitment. This is about actually the shift and shape of marketing teams, particularly uh, accelerated over the last two or three years and particularly accelerated over the last 18 months. So I just want to share with you um, this, the size of the, of, the, of the place that you're in at the moment. And if we look at um, the next slide, what we're talking about here is confidence. So marketing employers, interestingly, we extrapolated this data for marketeers specifically for you. Marketing employers were much more optimistic about the wider economic climate and the employment opportunities it may create within the next two to five years than most other professions. And if you can see the line here, 33 percent, that was how they felt in 2020. End of last year, 64% said, actually, we are fairly confident in the economic climate in the, in, in the medium to long term, two to five years. And in fact, that 63% is from a Pulse survey we did in the last month. And I'll refer to some of the other data from the Pulse survey as right up to the minute data from the last four to six weeks. So this does include the terrible goings on um, and the terrible situations that we're, we're facing with Ukraine. So even with withstanding uh, the fuel crisis, withstanding um, that terrible situation, marketers are still feeling, I think, pretty optimistic about the wider economic climate and the long-term employment opportunities. And our recent spring survey, that 63%, as I say, is only in the last four weeks. That survey closed about two weeks ago. We haven't even actually printed up all the data for it yet, but I wanted to share that with you because I think it shows a very strong sign about our marketplace. 
But if we are looking at what confidence brings, we are inevitably looking at demand. And demand for talent has soared over, over the last eight years to a record high. Off the back of this boost in confidence, demand has, has soared to 80% of employers across the UK, that's all disciplines, that's HR, IT, saying that they expect to hire in the year 2022. And that has increased from 70% from last year. And what we need to remember is these hiring intentions are also the highest levels we've seen in the eight years since we began the survey. So this is real, real data for us and, and, and it's a huge increase. In marketing specifically, 81% of employers said they plan to hire in, in the, this year, 2022, and that's an increase from 67% last year. And in fact, the Pulse survey, the last four weeks data, tells us it's sitting at between 68 and 70% now. So this, this, this is the overall for the financial year, has dipped a little bit in the last four weeks. But the rapid acceleration of the marketing function, as I said earlier, in many organizations, shows no sign of abating. Digital transformation and the journey that a lot of businesses are still on is gathering pace. Marketing overall is becoming more commercial every year and more valued. And post pandemic, we sincerely hope it's post pandemic, the role of commercial and communications experts internally, externally have been recognized. I have seen businesses where marketing has been catapulted into the boardroom or the committee room the most senior place a business or organization has, as the voice of the customer was, uh, was, was such a desperate need last year for many organizations that thought they had already heard it. So I sincerely hope that this place that marketing finds itself, and by the way, when I say marketing, I'm referring to marketing communications, obviously, and the tech roles in marketing across the whole functions, I mean. I'm hoping that the shift in shape of these teams will continue to reflect the need of the voice of the customer and have it loudly heard in that center of a business, an organization, a university, where we need to be sat to be part of the strategic and objective setting of that business. So that's the positive. The demands, however, in developing not just the technology, but the, more, the impetus of those new teams or those teams that are currently in place that are shifting to meet the demands of the customer is leading in turn to these developing skills shortages, storytelling, CRM, front end content design, are amongst some of those shortages and skill sets we're seeing. Marketing employers are also keener at the moment to secure permanent hires, with about 70% planning on recruiting permanent staff in comparison to 51% last year. So there's definitely been, a, I suppose, to follow the sentiment in, 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 in positivity, we're now seeing more employers saying, actually, we want to take on permanent members of the team. And this high demand for talent is really being driven by that combination of organisations hurrying again, following obviously a freeze in some places during the pandemic, others taking advantage of the recovery, seizing the opportunity to grow, and that, that communication that's probably been increased and amplified with their customer, they want to hold on to that. However, alongside a demand for talent is a skills shortage, and it is skyrocketed. Across the UK, overall 86% of employers said we've experienced skills shortages in the last year. That was last year, 2021. And at that point in 2021, 80% of marketing employers said the same. As you can see in our very short poll survey of a month ago, that's gone up to 83%. And in marketing, they've experienced skill shortages in the last year, which is an increase from about 70% from the year before. And it's going, it's going to be uh, tougher as we go through the next quick months. So a quick overview um, on what the world of marketing looks like just because I thought you might be interested in some very up-to-the-moment up to, up to, to data. And it's an exciting place to be in marketing. If you're just beginning, if you're studying, if you're just beginning your CIM qualifications, it's a really exciting place to be. But it has got its challenges with these skill shortages, and it is going to continue to do so as marketing continues to become an even more paramount part of a successful business. So let's talk about our, our survey that we did on equity, diversity, and inclusion. Each year, there are key days in campaigns, such as National Inclusion Week, Black History Month, International Women's Day, Pride, Purple Light Up, and a host of others, offering individuals and organizations an opportunity to demonstrate their support and promote really discussion around some major ED&I considerations. But we need to challenge ourselves whether all this talk actually is meaningful. 
To put together the report, we carried out a survey last July, August into early September. So this is um, about six months ago. And uh, again, a proportion of the, the responses that were marketeers, we've tried to distill down into that data, find some insights to share with you today. The survey was completed by professionals from a range of backgrounds and a huge variety of organization types and sizes. And this was across both public and private sectors. So let's look at what our report initially uncovered. Across the UK, employers were more confident, 55%, that their ED&I talk translated into real action than employees, which was 44%. But overall, this figure here, 48%, indicates less than half of those surveyed believe that real action was going to take place. A very disappointing number. If we take this 48 as an average, 51% of women overall responded to say that their organisation was delivering more than just lip service to EDI, but many individuals from groups who are typically underrepresented, such as ethnic minorities, uh, members of the LGBTQ community, those with mental health or neurodivergence, were less likely to feel that their employer takes positive action to improve EDI. These findings suggest really that current actions are not sufficient, they're undercommunicated. And they're certainly not landing with and impacting the people whom they're often intended to reach. And I, I suppose against the context of where the benefits of ED&I at an individual and an organisational level are increasingly clear and understood, 62% of marketing PR and comms professionals say their employer actively talks about the importance of ED&I in their workplace. But only a third, as you can see, believe their employer combines discussion with notable action. So in short, the amount of talk isn't being matched by action. And we all know, without action, talk of equity, diversity and inclusion rings very hollow. And a lack of action may even draw assumptions of indifference, which would be dreadful for an organisation when it comes to ED&I. So let's have a look at the equal opportunity and how it feels. This particular slide is across all disciplines. I'll drill down into some marketing specific data on the next slide. But on this slide, this is across those 15 different um, disciplines, HR, IT, marketing, etc. If we look at the full survey results, when asked to consider their own organisation, our respondents felt that the following groups did not have an equal opportunity to succeed. As you can see, those with differing ethnic backgrounds, women, those over 50 and those with a disability. This is genuinely a really disappointing set of data. And if we look at marketing specific data, we can drill down on the slide to how marketeers actually feel. And when I do a round table with um, four or five uh, decision makers, we have a more open conversation, obviously, because we have uh, more time. Everybody stops on this slide. And I think they'd stop because we'd like to change it. And we have to change it. But we have to accept the data is as it stands. Under half of marketing PR and comms professionals do not believe people from all backgrounds will have an equal opportunity to succeed in their organisation, ever. Close to half believe there will be equal opportunity in five years or beyond. 9% believe this will, happen, this, this will happen within the next five years. It is a disappointing set of, of data. We do need to take a, 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 a while to think about it. But we then have to drill down further and maybe look at the factors that professionals feel lead to their chances of being selected for a job being lowered. Now, this is um, unfortunately purple and pink. And what I mean by that is um, sometimes it's quite difficult to see what the data is trying to tell us on these two colours. The dark pink is 2021 and the light pink is 20. So if we look at another aspect of equal opportunity, each year we run our survey, we ask the question of professionals whether they felt any factors have led to their chances of being selected for a job being lowered. Interestingly, for marketing, 61% of respondents felt their chances have been impacted by an identifying factor. This data here again on this slide is for all professions. If you compare the figures for 2020 and 2021, there's been some small improvements across the UK. Uh, for example, 56% of professionals cite age as a factor um, that they felt led to their chances of being selected, um, compared to 63% in 2020. However, I think we need to be um, honest with ourselves. For most of the factors, there's been a slight negative trend. For example, in 2020, 85% of respondents felt their ethnicity and nationality had led to their chance of being selected. In 2021, 
this had increased to 42%. This suggests that honestly, in some areas, things are going backwards despite greater awareness. How can we overcome challenges to create such needed change? Well, here's a list of some challenges that employers anticipate when trying to turn talk into action. So those employers that are trying are challenged. The biggest challenge that employers across a range of professions expect to face when looking to turn their EDI into action is overcoming resistance to change. 45%, that's a very high number. Other challenges include employee engagement, uh, it's not a business priority, and not enough resource being placed to deliver the required action that they want to see happen. But as professionals, what actions would they like their organisations to take? So if I'm a marketeer, what am I wanting my business to do? On the left, that's the data from the 50 professions. On the right is the data from the marketing community. So the top actions from a range of professions they say you want to see is more training for managers and training for employees. Within marketing, there's an even higher proportion that would like to see more training. And this is the highest proportion actually across all disciplines. And across the UK, a further 38% said, I want my organisation to review its recruitment policies. Again, in marketing, it's an even higher percentage that wants this to take place and they want it to happen now. There's a variety of other actions that people have discussed. Some included um, trying to get a wider talent pool by maybe uh, looking for not-for-profit organisations to recruit from. Um, we ourselves in Hayes have um, joined up with um, Black Young Professionals, which is a brilliant organisation. We've only just begun a partnership with them. Um, and that's what we're trying to do to support our own EDI programme, which we take very seriously in Hayes, but also to be able to support our customers in their EDI journey as well. And um, a lot of organisations are now saying, actually, what we need is internal EDI ambassadors. But as we know in our world of marketing, communication is the key. And here, of course, communication about progress in anything connected with EDI is absolutely vital. And yet, if we take a view on this slide, at either end of the communication spectrum, 45% of marketing, PR and commerce professionals say their employer does not share the progress they make. And only 16% say they feel they're communicating with very regularly about it. The remaining balance, obviously, is somewhere in between. So I think we have to ask ourselves at some stage, what role do we play particularly in the marketing team? We're the custodians of the brand. We listen to the voice of the customer. We're responsible for supporting the culture of a business and setting the values. We need to think about where is our role. But we also need to think about what can employers do to step up their efforts to hire more diverse talent. That really is the key. What can they do? Because just 8%, 8%, of marketing, PR, and comms professionals believe their organization's workforce demographic is a fair reflection of today's society, 8%. And over half, I think it's about 55% of marketing professionals do not believe there are sufficient efforts across their organization to recruit diverse talent. So we do need to try and find some positives here. Um, so what, what do we think? The demographic groups that professionals feel are organisations will benefit attracting. What do we think? What is happening? What can we do? What, what do we see as marketers and commerce people that we genuinely think would make a difference? Well, the demographic groups of professionals across a wide range of professions uh, feel are shown here. Hiring and retaining more, more people that include different ethnic backgrounds, those with disability, women, those from disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds, and those over 50 years of age, you can see here. If I zoom in on marketing, PR and comms professionals, they think their organisation would benefit in attracting, hiring and of course retaining more people from different ethnic backgrounds with 63%. So much higher than all of the other, discipl the other disciplines, professionals, which chose 63% chose differing ethnic backgrounds we genuinely believe would make a difference. Those with disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds was 43%, still a very high number. And those who identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community 42% and women 38% and those with a disability 36%. Marketeers clearly feel very strongly about how we need to change the shape and the makeup of our teams. So what top approaches are organisations taking to attract diverse candidates? Well the most common approach 
this was and, and bearing in mind this was last year end of last year so you know sort of july to september i say end of last year um towards the latter part of last year when hybrid and remote working had become a huge topic of conversation and i think that's important to bring out here because still after all of those changes through pandemic that we've all worked through the most common approach that employers were taking still uh, was trying to attract a diverse range of talent was about flexible working 65 percent i'm interested in that because 65 70 we're going to offer remote working when we move into the, the new normal i don't agree with the new normal i think we're just in what mckinsey's would say is the next normal who knows what the next one might be so that's a super interesting point to think about actually offering flexible working as opposed to just remote because i think there's a huge difference between remote hybrid and flexible um, hybrid is is what a lot of organizations are doing obviously you're probably part of that some days in the office i'm not fully remote uh, it is not going in at all but flexible is much more than that um, and i wish we had a little bit more time today to delve into it but i have got more data and information on that that i can send you about the plethora of different ways flexible working can can work um, for um, those that, um, that maybe need more support a further third 33 percent say they advertise on recruiting platforms if you can see that now on recruiting platforms that speak directly to underrepresented groups and that and i, I flipped down to that one because that's what we realized and that's why we're, we've um, joined the, with this partnership very recent early this year with um black young professionals and they're a super organization and again happy to put anybody in touch with them if they'd like um and it's been a very important part of our growth in our own edi world so before we we go to the q a um, I would just like to say that um, when I've um, worked with businesses and, and marketing comms teams, there's always been a great deal of energy and genuine concern but enthusiasm for an EDI programme from the marketing and comms perspective. Most marketing professionals I speak to want to be part of what is right. Most organisations I speak to, their marketing teams feel that they hold a really important place in the EDI program, the EDI uh, um, progress of the business, our own marketing team have been massively supportive in, in a lot of initiatives we've got. Um, we've got a great pride network. We have some fantastic days of celebration every month, uh, not just the, the the ones that maybe we all know. Lots of celebrations for lots of different um, uh, days and uh, and cultural beliefs that I've been unaware of myself, and I've been hugely educated in the last two or three years. I think also with um, the other challenge we have around ED&I is, as I say, with the, with the, board, the custodians of the brand, we, we tend to be the voice of the business. I think now, as, as the last couple of years, as I said, in my world, I've seen customers talk to me about hyper-digitalization, being catapulted in the boardroom. Now is the time, I think, for us to take responsibility. And now is the time, I think, there's an appetite, there's an openness, um, more than I've seen before, around this whole complex issue of ED&I. And I think as marketers and communication specialists, we need to we need to take our part and play our part in that. So I, I do hope that's giving you um, uh, an, an idea. We have to say there's a lot more detail and a lot more data we could share with you. We also have um, other material that we use internally and that we share with um, marketing managers and, uh, and marketing and communication directors in, in our support of supporting them in their EDI journey. Okay, so we're going to have a, court, a short Q&A session and we've already got some questions to get us underway. Um, first question uh, going back to the um, skill shortage, uh, Claire. So uh, I know you noticed that you mentioned that there was a, a, a perceived skill shortage amongst marketers. Um, what sort of technical and skills are, are, are in short supply and, and are there any soft skills that are in short supply as well? I think because IBM uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic, probably three or four months into the pandemic, um, noticed that uh, they coined this phrase um, hyper digitalization actually, um, because a lot of um, organizations felt that from a marketing perspective, they were uh, sort of complementous with their technology. They had the right technology um, to ensure they could attract, retain uh, and, and build their business from a customer perspective. Actually, they realized, a lot of organizations realized they simply didn't. What else happened was organisations, a lot of them, charities, universities um, and, and, and SME organisations also realised that the um, programme that they and the journey they were on with their um, digital marketing suite um, was not progressive enough. So what happened um, over the last 18 months was a, an urgent need and a, a, a supply issue, I suppose, the skill sets around data, data analytics, but the more important one, the insight part of data analytics, SEO, PPC, 
um, are also highly sought after and anyone with the skill set are sort of UX UI um, and, and web development, front end web development by which I mean content design. So those are the more technical. I mean, interesting though, but let's bear in mind though, top in the top five job roles for the last year, 18 months have been marketing manager and marketing assistant. There is still a great need for marketeers with the depth and breadth and overarching knowledge of the true function of marketing. Okay, great. Um, do you have any tips on platforms to reach underrepresented groups? Well, we, we have, um, as I say, um, Black Young Professionals is, is an organisation that we've um, started working very closely with. Um, I would be happy to speak to my internal marketing team, my marketing director, um, Robs, uh, and ask him what other platforms um, we have reached out to. That's one I've been involved with. There are many. Um, and I know actually we've looked at quite a few. So if that individual is comfortable and wants to reach out to me directly, um, I'm more than happy to um, respond to that after I speak to my marketing director. But yes, BYP is the most recent one we found and it's working it's working really well for us, um, educating us, to be honest, um, and also for, for not just for internally, the internal Hayes, Eden and I, but for supporting our customers in their own journey. Um. Next question is, do we think ED and I should sit on the communications desk or on the HR person's desk? This is an oft debate I have um, uh, when we present this. Um, I think it's a dual responsibility. I certainly don't think it belongs in HR alone, where I think for many years potentially it has sat. Because I think, as I say, you know, marketing is so intrinsically um, critical to the culture of a business and um, to to the to the external customer as well um, it's the voice so I do think marketing has to play a part I think communications definitely have to play a part because if our own world of marketing don't believe that we're communicated to enough about potentially good stuff happening in EDR around our business then that sits firmly at our desk I also think though where we need to look at from a communications perspective is is different ways of communicating sometimes the good stuff we do around ed and i um as i say um, our comms team came came up our marketing team comms team came up with um the lgbtq um plus lanyards for us which doesn't sound particularly exciting but actually when you're in a business of three thousand people as a managing director of the business when i wear my lanyard around the business it does communicate my, my support to that particular community and I have had people come and ask for a quiet conversation with me because I've had it on. Now, that's just a very simple product, but that actually came from the marketing team as a way of expressing support to, to our own business, uh, not from HR. So I think it's a dual responsibility. I think actually every single individual in any business holds responsibility for Eden and I. But I think, I think comms needs to take some of that ownership and look at how they can share with their internal and external customer base, both, uh, the great work that I'm sure some businesses are doing um, but they just don't express it. Um, do you have any tips for overcoming the resistance to change? How to deal with people who do not believe that any change is needed? Big question. Well, actually, um, I'm taking uh, two of, of um, my senior ladies, our senior ladies, I should say, our senior ladies in, in, my, in my Hayes team, through a change methodology programme as we speak. Now, the change methodology programme was built for us by KPMG. Um, for our very senior leadership team um, and we're cascading it through the business over the next few years and so what I've started um, from a personal perspective is is talking about why we don't embrace change so I picked two individuals who are highly talented but who find change difficult so I deliberately and I've told them uh, I've been very authentic with them um, this is why we're going to start together as a team of three because we you know some of us find it difficult to embrace change so actually sharing with the team why change is needed um, is the most important thing. And I do think we need to follow a pattern. I'm, as you know, Phil, I'm a bit more of a deliverer. I'm a very typical salesperson. I'm very excited about data and I want to deliver everything. Um, what I need to remember is that I need to actually plan. Um, I said I need to shape. So I need to start shaping and planning and then deliver. And that's what I think marketers can be hugely supportive in when you're trying to make change with people who are struggling with it. If we can shape the plan with them, uh, I don't mean by committee, but shape the plan with them, with their input. And then if we can share the plan with them, with their input, you find when it comes to delivery that they're keen to, they're keen to be part of that. So I think I would say from personal experience, I've had to take a step back 
and stop trying to deliver and just actually say, right, let's get everybody that's involved and ask their opinion on what the shape is and why we want to, to make the change, what the change might feel like. And I, I have to make myself do this because I didn't actually just dive in. Actually, what does change feel like to you? And it feels very different to a lot of people. And you'd be surprised how many senior people, very senior people, really struggle with it. And interestingly, I think that's somewhere, uh, somewhere at the beginning of where change can be difficult in an organisation, because some of the most senior people in those decision making places can find change difficult. So if you're if you are in a position to influence at whatever level, and I believe, by the way, anybody from an associate to a main board director can influence, I would I would start with embracing the change myself and then finding people that I knew found it difficult and being authentic with them about that and take them on a journey. And it might just be a handful of people who will become your greatest advocates and they will absolutely become your greatest influencers. Okay, great. That's great advice. Um how real is the age problem? Um, I know lots of highly experienced people who indicate now they are over 50, they can't get work. How can this be addressed? Well, if we if we refer back to the slide that I showed you where, where we talk about that, um, the 32% uh, um, of people believe that their, their age, those over 50, by the way, believe their age um, has impacted their ability to get a job, and 34% uh, of women. Um, I think there is an education piece uh, that we all hold responsibility for but i do see change and i don't have data on it for you yet um i'm a salesperson not a not a marketer bear that in mind but i do see a change i think the last two years have opened up everybody's uh imagination to the possibilities of what the future could look like the shift in shape of teams how we work where we work when we work so so I do think this has impacted in a positive way, actually, on all of those um, four very disappointing pieces of data, and particularly on age. I mean, obviously, you don't have age on CVs from GDPR perspective. Uh, lots of our organisations are now doing what we call blind interviewing. So um, from a uh, blind CV, sorry. Um, so there's no age, there's no ethnicity. Um, sometimes there's no education. And we're, in fact, piloting a lot of those in pays, recruiting our own people. And so I think that there's a flexibility there's a hybrid working model now. All of that does help um, minority groups. And I do think that those over 50 have an enormous amount to offer. And, and I think 50 is the new 30, personally. Um, and I do think that employers have, have woken up and are continually to be woken up by the uh, importance of expertise and experience. And different teams, um, are uh, the different makeup in teams is what makes teams more successful. So the greater uh, the, the diversity of your team, uh, whether it's ethnicity, uh, neo-divergent or age, people know we've got data to prove those teams are more successful. So I think it's constantly holding on to that truth and sharing it with as many people as we can. And if we are in a position to be recruiting, uh, ensuring that we are doing everything we can to embrace all of those, all of those minority groups. But I do think, I genuinely do see a shift in behaviour and from a recruiter's perspective, because that's what I see, obviously, um, in much more flexibility than I probably saw five to ten years ago. Oh, that's great news. Um, okay, thank you for that. Um, we've implemented an EDI committee and ambassador as well as targets. However, the rest of the organisation seems to think of marketing as showcasing EDI rather than driving it. What can marketing practically do to help drive EDI in their organisations? Well, if I look at um, organisations that I've worked with closely and, and also take into account what we've tried to do here, um, I would I would um, I would use that skill that great marketers have, which is that negotiation piece, um, interpersonal skills and negotiation. By the way, that they are the top two, well, top two out of the top three soft skills required at the moment in marketing communications, uh, the ability to adopt change actually, um, and interpersonal skills. I would use those, and I would reach out to the parts of the business that were challenged and I would uh, ask them to, to, to have ambassadors themselves. So for example, um, the legal team, uh, uh, the, your purchasing team, the HR community, the manufacturing team, your engineers, whatever it might be. We've done um, a couple of surveys where we ask our own people to share the data with us. Um, every time we do that data request, we're getting a higher percentage sharing their personal data. But of course that comes down to trust. Um, and the employees feeling that it's trusted, that they are trusted and they have trust in the organisation to care for 
be, be careful with their data, keep it keep it confidential, and be careful uh, how they value that data. So I think that's another message marketing could, could support is that authenticity, that genuine uh, desire to be the best place to work for its employees. Therefore, the more involved they can get. Um, one of the simplest things we did do was the lanyards, which opened up a whole new conversation um, uh, in, in a very public way. Um, I think it's a figure was that 63% of marketers um, don't believe that their organisation recruits um, enough from different, different ethnic backgrounds. Do you think that um, is reflected in the type of marketing that these organisations might do? Are they sort of overlooking um, you know, sectors of the of the population if they don't have diverse marketing teams? Well, I've got a couple of anecdotes, obviously confidential, anonymous, I should say, but um, I, I, I was talking to a very senior comms director, um, two senior comms directors from two different um, higher education establishments, and whilst we were talking about this particular issue, they both said the biggest challenge they have is that their current team doesn't represent um, a diverse place to be. So trying to um, bring in um, talent from some of those ethnic minority groups or, or some of those um, minority groups, LGBT groups, etc., is hard because when you're interviewing those, the, 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 those fantastic individuals, they don't see a place um, where they see themselves. So that is a challenge. The current makeup of your marketing and comms team uh, needs, needs to have a lens on it. Um, and also, we need to ensure that, that, that we are showing and showcasing genuinely um, our, our belief in ed &I at every stage, before the interview, during the interview and after the interview. One of the biggest challenges I think that marketing could look at really is, does your um, business, does your business show your great work you do on ed &I? Do I see it? When I look, look at your organisation, can I see it? Is it obvious? Or do I have to go through the internet page after page after page and then I find some policy that's, um, I don't need to be baptised by, you know, some policy that, that's not very um, exciting or, or I can't find it or it's just quite dry to read. Marketeers, as you can see from the data, wholly support ed &I and they want to see more of it and they're disappointed with what their community is doing at the moment. But in turn, for that to change, we probably have to look at some of those obvious things, such as that does our brand portray the image we want it to portray, not just to our consumers, but to our em employees and to future talent that we want to bring in. So I think, I think that, and that was it was really insightful of two or three of those very senior comms people said, you know, it was it was a bit of an awakening. Actually, when I looked at the board, uh, the panel that were interviewing for these, there were senior roles too. I, I looked across the board and they all looked like me. We didn't look diverse. We were not a diverse team that were doing the interviewing. So why would people want to join our team or believe, you know, that we were focused on ED&I? So I think that's a simple thing you can look at. What, what do we look like when we, when we, when we interview? And I'm not suggesting for one minute that, that we betray something that's not true. You know, if, we, if we're not diverse, we're not diverse. Um, but we, we just need to be able to portray that we're on the journey, you know, the truthful journey that they could be a great part of it. Okay, so sadly this is all the time we have for our webinar today. Um, I'd just like to say thank you again to Claire for uh, your excellent presentation um, and to the CIM Greater London Group for organising the event. We do hope that you have enjoyed the session and found it interesting and worthwhile. Um, we'll be back with our next webinar express behind the curtain and A to Z of Arts Marketing on Tuesday the 12th of April at our usual time of 1 p.m. You'll find further details listed on the events page on the CIM website, where you will also be able to register for the session. So on behalf of CIM, that just leaves me to thank Claire once again for a fantastic presentation and to say a thank you to you for joining us today. Take care, everyone, and we look forward to welcoming you again to our webinars in the future.